So in 2012, under the leadership of Dr. Kenneth Rosenfeld, Mass General was credited with forming the first pulmonary embolus response team. That multidisciplinary team was comprised of pulmonologists, critical care specialists, interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, and cardiothoracic surgeons. Around this time, Dr. Chuck Ross was recruited to Piedmont. And as part of Dr. Ross's recruitment, he and others went on to form Piedmont Atlanta Hospital's Level 1 Cardiovascular Emergency Program in 2014. And with it, Piedmont Atlanta's pulmonary embolus response team was formed. In 2015, Dr. Rosenfeld went on to lead the creation of the National PERT Consortium, with Piedmont joining as a founding member on the team, one of 40 such programs in the country. Members of our Piedmont Atlanta team have served on leadership positions within the National PERT Consortium since that time, with Dr. Chuck Ross and Dr. Andrew Klein serving as board members and as leaders on the Clinical Protocols Committee. Through the national partnership with the PERT Consortium, Piedmont has been a participant in numerous publications advancing the science of understanding pulmonary embolism care for the country as well as for our healthcare system. Meanwhile, back in 2013, Piedmont Healthcare was a five hospital system that today has grown to 24 facilities of which 19 are hospitals with 15 ICU programs across the state. Piedmont's continuing to work through system, regional, and local leadership and care close to home models. And for our ICU programs, we've worked to adopt level one, two, and three program staffing models and service delineations that align with best practice and have built a system level critical care committee linking all of our ICU medical directors, nursing directors, and respiratory therapy directors. We've extended invitations across the healthcare system for those team members to join this educational session. Today, we're joined by several members of our Piedmont Atlanta PERT team to provide an educational update on the state of the industry in 2023. We're looking to teams like our PAH PERT members and their national partners at the PERT Consortium to help define what type of care should be occurring and where and how this aligns with resourcing needs locally, regionally, and at the system level. We have a great group of speakers here with us today most have been with the PERT program since its founding in 2014. They reflect the multidisciplinary membership of PERT programs as we have pulmonary critical care physicians, intensivists, interventional cardiology, vascular surgery, and cardiothoracic surgery represented on the panel. We will start off with Dr. Craig Patterson as we move through our packed agenda. And please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, Chad. The topic of pulmonary embolism uh, is viewed through the lens of uh, an academic presentation or an educational endeavor is very daunting. And every one of these brief topic overviews could essentially serve as an hour long or more lecture. Our goal is not to cover every aspect of pulmonary embolism, but to really put the focus on what the PERT team does, which is to treat pulmonary embolism from the perspective of a logistical problem, a process issue, and to kind of walk through some of the steps and provide a framework to clinically manage patients with PE. So I want to start to just kind of give you an idea, and my whole goal in these first few minutes really is just to have you take away kind of a gestalt about pulmonary embolism. I think if you had uh, asked me what would be the most surprising and most impactful individual diagnosis that I'd be taking care of at this juncture in my career back when I was a fellow, uh, I wouldn't have necessarily said that pulmonary embolism would have been that diagnosis. Uh, certainly it's always been very common, but I am blown away every day, every week, every month, and every year by the burden of venous thromboembolic disease that we treat at this hospital and in this health system. Uh, it seems to have become more and more frequent, at least by Gestalt and my anecdotal experience. I think a lot of that probably has to do with the practice environment that we're in here at Atlanta specifically, but the Piedmont, excuse me, the Piedmont Healthcare Network really takes care of an incredible number of venous thromboembolic disease cases and a wide uh, 
variety of cases with lots of nuance and subtlety and complexity. And I'm particularly thankful to be a part of a group like the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team and the Piedmont Healthcare Network in general uh, in the management of these patients. So PE is really a changing landscape over the last couple of decades. Uh, we think that uh, by some studies, the incidence of pulmonary embolism may be increasing over time, even though our handle on treating the disease is getting better. And some studies, some preliminary data seems to suggest that the morbidity and mortality associated with PE in individual cases could be lessening, and perhaps that gives us some ho more hope for the future. Uh, we've got a wide variety of treatment options available, uh, potentially to use in some of these challenging cases, things that we really did not have at our disposal as recently as uh, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. And so um, every month, every year brings uh, new perspectives, new ideas, and new challenges. Just to take away a few uh, notions about the scope of pulmonary embolism, I want you to really be stuck with the four words that I've got on the left-hand side of the screen. Pulmonary embolism is common. Pulmonary embolism is potentially deadly. It's a preventable condition, and all of us have a role in preventing PE, and certainly we have a role in treating PE, and as I alluded to, the options and the ways in which we may treat pulmonary embolism are changing uh, over time. There are about 900,000 cases of venous thromboembolic disease in the United States every year, leading to 200,000 hospitalizations for pulmonary embolism. And at the end, about 60 to 100,000 people die from pulmonary embolism every year in the United States. That's the equivalent of an SEC stadium filled with fans on a Saturday afternoon in the fall every year. So this is a tremendously impactful disease. The morbidity and mortality are very real. We feel that every day, um, and we have a role in addressing that. The challenges are that patients present with pulmonary embolism in a variety of different ways with a variety of different clinical features, signs, and symptoms. The treatments that we have are variable and may vary from clinician to clinician depending upon specialty, depending upon their individual practice environment, uh, also depending upon what guidelines inform the way that an individual clinician or a group of clinicians may practice. Um, there are European Society of Cardiology guidelines, American College of Chest Physicians, uh, and many others around the world that may inform our understanding about the best practices uh, for how to treat patients with these conditions. And lastly, there are few good, robust clinical trials that really uh, paint a full picture and give us clear uh, and uh, unambiguous uh, processes and approaches to treat patients with venous thromboembolic disease. I want to throw just a few additional facts at you, again, to just impress upon you um, some key elements of uh, venous thromboembolic disease. PE is the third leading cause of cardiovascular death in the United States. There is a four to five times higher incidence of pulmonary embolism in patients over 75 years of age. And in fact, the incidence of PE tracks with age uh, over the population. More than half of the PE-related deaths in the United States and Europe are healthcare associated. And I think uh, we can all appreciate that we are in an era where um, our focus and our emphasis on reducing uh, harms associated with caring for patients in the hospital setting and in the outpatient setting uh, is very real and characterizes our practice. This is absolutely one of those conditions right alongside hospital-acquired infections and the like uh, that we have a direct impact at reducing uh, the burden and providing better care to our population. Interestingly, as many as 90% of patients who are hospitalized with PE tend to die with other conditions. PE really is, although not exclusively, but it really does tend to track with medical comorbidities. And so, uh, particularly in an environment that takes care of a lot of complex patients with many different medical conditions, uh, PE is often uh, something that gets people into the hospital only to then have other 
uh, exacerbations of chronic medical problems uh, that may lead to their death. And these are things that we really need to look out for. And again, emphasizes the benefits of working closely with professionals in a variety of different disciplines. And as I alluded to before, the incidence of PE is rising, but PE-related mortality may be declining, giving us some hope for the future. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, as with almost any disease, we tend to classify it into categories, and in PE, we risk stratify the patient. Why is this important? Well, primarily because it drives management. Uh, there is a difference between somebody who comes in with a small segmental PE versus somebody who arrives in shock uh, in a trauma bay. Uh, all right, some of the historical features uh, that you might find important and should probably be charting and communicating, particularly if you're talking about transferring a patient to another facility, because these are the things that we are looking for that are important in deciding what interventions are to be uh, performed. Historical features, obviously if somebody arrives in a cardiac arrest, important to know. Syncope, very important to know. Um, things like sensation of feeling of doom or uh, I'm gonna die. Uh, those are the historical features. In terms of vital signs, things we look for, tachycardia, hypoxia. You can look at a shock index, which is your heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. Anything greater uh, than 0.89 tends to be predictive of poor outcomes, including death and right ventricular dysfunction, um, including pulse pressure as well. Labs that would be important to look at. Troponin, BNP, which will look at myocardial tissue damage and myocardial strain, uh, respectively. Lactate, which will give you an assessment of uh, poor tissue perfusion. Serum creatinine also is uh, independently associated with worse outcomes the higher it becomes. Once you diagnose a PE, usually on CT, there are certain findings that are also important, primarily findings of uh, elevated RV to LV ratio. Uh, anything greater than one is more specific for poor outcomes in the inpatient state. Findings of, hepatic re of uh, reflux of contrast into the liver also tells you that there is elevated pressures. And if you are lucky enough to catch clot in transit, that also increases your risk. Echocardiographic findings that you look for. Once again, you can look at the RV to LV ratio, which you will be looking at in the four uh, chamber apical view. Tapsy. Um, I don't know where the echo is. Tapsy, which is the tricuspid annual pulmonary systolic excursion. Anything less than 16 millimeters is very specific for P specific and all cause mortality. You can also see clot in transit. And then you look at all of this together and you can look at an integrative data scoring systems. The two that we generally use is PESI, which is a little bit more data intense and the simplified PESI score uh, or pulmonary embolism severity index. And these are, I'll be presented on the next slide. And you can also look at Dopplers. You wonder, are they super necessary or not? Because it most of the time will not necessarily change the management, but I think the sicker the patient is with a PE, the more likely you should get that. As a uh, present of a concomitant DVT in addition to a PE is about twice as likely predictor of uh, all-cause mortality within the first month. <clears throat> All right, um, I guess just a quick uh, illustration of the CT findings of uh, elevated RV to LV ratio and the echo findings of a McConnell sign, which is very specific uh, for pulmonary embolism. The, what you see in a McConnell sign, I'm sure some of my colleagues will probably go over it, is you see uh, RV free wall echinacea, um, 
which is so the free wall is not moving but the apex tend to contract the apical contraction is believed to be still occurring because of the shared myocardial fibers at the apex with the left ventricular uh, with the left ventricle and there is differential wall stress uh, due to the acute elevation of pressure leading the RV wall not to be really contracting well. All right, so right here you see the, uh, the pulmonary embolism severity index, the original version and the simplified. Clearly much easier to go with that. You avoid vital signs such as an uh, alteration of mental status. It's very good at predicting what the mortality is. So if you have somebody who is a PES, uh, simplified PESI zero, so zero points, your chance of, mor your chance of dying is about 1%. Anything uh, greater than that, 10 and a half over 10%. Um, this scoring system has been used in evaluating patients for early discharge from the ER. Uh, and allowing them to be treated for a pulmonary embolism at home. So when we look at all these vitals and uh, signs and symptoms, uh, it is that's the information that we're looking for, and we probably should be put it in, in our note and in our presentation to a transfer center. Um, <clears throat> It's also important to reevaluate the patient because the PE can be very dynamic and what you see in a patient now, 30 minutes later, they may be deteriorating, so frequent checks on these patients and rerounds is a very good idea. All right, so this is the current risk stratification scheme. Uh, <clears throat> high risk usually includes some form of hemodynamic instability which usually means the patient's, uh, patient is undergoing CPR, they're hypotensive with a systolic blood pressure less than 90, or they've had a drop in their systolic blood pressure from their baseline by 40 millimeters of mercury or more for at least 15 minutes, and it's not been explained by some other cause. Or they're on pressors. Um, usually at that time, you'll have a high uh, clinical predictor score, you will have positive uh, RV dysfunction on echo or CT, and you will have elevated cardiac biomarkers. The rough number of patients that will fall into that category is probably about 13 to 15 percent. Low risk category usually means you have a PE and everything else is fine. This will be close to 50%, about 47% of your patients uh, will fall into that category. Their mortality rate is about 1%. The high risk category ranges anywhere from 20 to 65 because it tends to be quite a bit of a spectrum. The one that is really kind of the question of where, what to do and where do we go is the intermediate. This is what used to be referred to as submassive PE and is divided further into intermediate high and intermediate low. Uh, with intermediate high having evidence of cardiac dysfunction, uh, both by biomarkers and by imaging, and you have an elevated uh, risk score. <clears throat> but you do not have avert hemodynamic instability. Together combined, in the intermediate low, you can see there's a slight difference there, but about 40% of all comers will be in that group uh, lumped together and with a mortality rate anywhere from 5 to 25%. So my colleagues will be talking primarily what to do really in the high, uh, high risk category and probably in the intermediate, and primarily more the intermediate high. Low at this point, we tend to treat just with standard anticoagulation with emphasis on early discharge home. We'll just go through a brief case and see what you guys think <clears throat> in terms of what the risk uh, category for this patient is. So we have a 65-year-old uh, Caucasian female with history of early breast stage cancer uh, on uh, adjuvant therapy on astrazole, a um, few other minor comorbidities, was seen at urgent care for cough and pneumonia, uh, was given doxy, 
didn't do well, came to the emergency room. Normotensive, maybe even slightly hypertensive, borderline tachycardic, respiratory rate 16, on room air, saturating fine, appears in no acute distress, not complaining of a lot of, uh, no, no, no pleurisy, but is having some right flank pain that is tender to palpation. She gets some labs, D-dimer is elevated, troponins checked at time zero, uh, two and four hours are normal, BNP is normal, her creatinine is normal, lactate was not obtained. She had Dopplers, negative. You get a CT. Shows uh, CT, uh, I guess they're not coming up. Well, I'll show you in just a minute. CT, so CT chest will show a pulmonary embolism and a pleural effusion. CT abdomen and pelvis shows a non-occlusive thrombus in the right iliac vein. Uh, here we go. You can see the uh, big clot in the right side. Going a little further. And you can see the RV to LVs actually was less than one. And there is her non-inclusive thrombus in the iliac vein. Uh, I put the red arrow this time. So the only thing, her uh, simplified PESI score is one because she had history of cancer, all right? Echo is obtained and her RV to our, uh, oops, RV to, should be said, RV to LV is normal. There's no McConnell sign. Her TAPC is normal. Her IVC is normal with greater than 50% collapse. Where would you guys throw this lady? Any takers? Right. The only thing she fulfills is this, right? So intermediate low. This is somebody who would be given standard anticoagulation, probably monitored in the hospital for about a day and sent home, which is exactly what happened. The interesting thing, of course, is that she presents a month later, a lot more dyspneic, the clot is not dissolved, now she has RV dysfunction. And now she has to go in for an intervention because she's feeling like crap. So is this perfect? No. Okay, is this a work in progress? Yes, is this the best that we currently have? I think so, and hopefully more clinical trials will tell us what really to do in this category of patients. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. So um, how do the 100,000 people a year die from PE? Uh, mostly it's from right ventricular failure. And a little foray into understanding this helps, helps us understand the best, uh, best means of clinical management in these patients. Venous thrombosis is always a severe disease and is often fatal because fragments of the thrombi may detach and include branches of the pulmonary artery. The occlusion of the main branches of the pulmonary artery causes a striking rise of the blood pressure in these vessels. This rise, which the right heart might fight in order to ensue circulation, rather ensure circulation, uh, may sometimes lead to cardiac arrest. This is the good Dr. Picot describing this phenomenon almost 150 years ago. And guess what? He was right. He was right then and he's right now. If we look at normal right ventricular physiology, the right ventricle serves a low pressure, low resistance system. And by low resistance, I mean low afterload. The RV is a thinly walled, but highly compliant structure. However, this very thin walled, highly compliant structure does not do well when challenged with acute increases in afterload. When this happens, what we find is a drastic reduction in stroke volume. If you look at this graph, you see the LV and the RV compared on the y-axis you see stroke volume, on the x-axis you see increase in afterload, and you can see the RLV tolerates it quite well. A significant increase in afterload only reduces stroke volume by a mere 10 to 15 percent. However, and conversely, the RV, it doesn't like it at all. You can see a drastic decrease in stroke volume with only modest increases in afterload. This is highly important in the decompensated PE state. 
if we think about the pathology of the pulmonary embolism uh, that leads to RV dysfunction and RV failure, in patients with pre-existing cardiopulmonary, uh, without pre-existing cardiopulmonary illness, you can include up to about 25 to 30 percent of the pulmonary vasculature before you see a rise in afterload and a subsequent rise in pulmonary artery pressure. However, if this continues, you get to anywhere from an estimated 50 to 70 percent occlusion of the pulmonary vascular bed, and at this point, the right ventricle is kicking out around a mean PA pressure of around 40. Any further elevation and afterload bad things start to happen, progressive RV failure and shock. The obvious is the obstruction. The clot is filling the pulmonary vascular bed. The RV has to deal with this, and as we've just demonstrated, it doesn't do well. However, there's some other factors that play a role, including hypoxia with local uh, vasoconstriction and some neurohormonal uh, activity on the tissue level, uh, secretion of um, compounds such as serotonin that also lead to vasoconstriction. Both of these cause a rise in RV afterload. This caused subsequent RV decompensation with an increase in RV volume. That increase in RV volume leads to an increase in ischemia by compression of the coronary vessels. You can see on the top there, normal coronary uh, artery coursing through uh, the right ventricle myocardium. Uh, and on the bottom, you see how, when the RV is dilated and begins to stretch, what happens to those vessels? they get squished, and you get ischemia. Moreover, you get septal shift. The RV balloons, it is pressure overloaded, and it starts to smash the LV. The pericardium restricts the LV from getting out of the way, and we've all seen this, where you can see that the right ventricle is compressing the septum, which is con further compressing the left ventricle. All of this yields an increase in wall stress, uh, oxygen consumption, and a decrease in left ventricular distensibility because the LV can't fill. Why? Because the RV is smashing it. The associated decrease in RV output, yet a further decrease in LV preload, not to mention the RV is smashing the LV. All of this yields a drop in mean arterial pressure, a subsequent drop in right ventricular coronary perfusion pressure, and then you get ischemia and the cycle continues until really bad things happen like an arrest. To correlate, you see mortality here on the y-axis and severity of uh, PE on the x, uh, noted severity being RV afterload or PE burden, uh, that in conjunction with uh, RV function. At this point, and that degree of afterload, you start to see the RV become unhappy. You see troponins uh, getting uh, secreted and leaked. Uh, you see an elevation in BNP. This is the first sign of RV dysfunction. And notice this almost exponential rise in badness all the way up to cardiac arrest and sudden death as the, uh, the severity or the increase in afterload uh, rises. This is almost an inverse of the curve we looked at earlier with the drop in stroke volume. But in the de decompensated uh, PE state, it's not just about the pressure in the RV afterload. There's some other issues at play, granted not near as important, but clinically relevant. Hypoxia, this is a no-brainer. This is, comes from primarily VQ mismatch. We see patients who are extremely ill with PE and often near death, but they're not that frankly hypoxemic. Other times they can be rather hypoxemic. An issue, nonetheless, that needs to be addressed, obviously due to hypoxemic vasoconstriction as well as tissue delivery of oxygen. Dead space. This is a big one and often not considered. Dead space being defined as ventilated areas of lung with no perfusion. You can imagine the patient's still breathing and breathing rapidly, but half their lung is not getting blood flow, hence they are not getting rid of CO2. This results in a subsequent increased work of breathing and an increased oxygen demand as oxygen consumption which we have just already described the RV is having a hard time with anyway. Moreover, the subsequent metabolic and respiratory acidosis that can ensue, which further make the RV myocardium even unhappier if not corrected. So why does this matter? Who cares about physiology anyway, right? Well, it does, because you make some very important moves and decisions clinically, such as shock management. For instance, we already said the RV is overloaded, it's a highly distensible structure, it's struggling, and the first rule of shock and sepsis is what? Load them up with the salt water. Well, in PE, that is not such a good idea. And in fact, we need to be quite easy with the IV fluid. Remember, this is not sepsis. 
Aggressive maintenance of MAP and coronary perfusion pressure. Again, the right ventricle, ventricle is hanging on by a thread. And any drop in coronary perfusion pressure could result in further ischemia and RV dysfunction, resulting in further shock and subsequent death. What vasopressors we choose to support the failing RV in the shock state? We'd obviously want to use pressors that are least offensive to raising pulmonary vascular resistance. The RV aisle after load in PVR is already sky high. So we would choose things like vasopressin, norepinephrine, over drugs like neosinephrine, which is a pure alpha constrictor. Then obviously tight acid base control. Oxygenation, ventilation, airway management. Again, extremely important. Avoidance of mechanical ventilation if possible. What does positive pressure do to RV afterload? It increases it. Non-invasive positive pressure is preferred if a patient can be maintained with that. High flow oxygen, also a great option. Remember, lots of pressures does not equal intubation. Again, in the sepsis world, we may find this to be the status quo, but in management of acute PE, stemming from the physiology that we're dealing with, this isn't necessarily a good idea. Perils of rapid sequence intubation and induction of anesthesia. Out of paper in uh, Maryland, at Maryland Shock Trauma, in fact, they looked at a 15% rate of intraoperative arrest on induction of anesthesia for surgical embolectomies of massive PEs. So they would bring them in for their surgical embolectomy, they would go to put them down under general anesthesia, and they would arrest. So guess what they do now? They put them on ECMO first. They don't intubate people electively in that case. Preemptive use of vasopressors avoid hypotension. Many of the drugs we use for rapid sequence intubation do what? They drop pressure. So let's keep that pressure up. And how many times we've had this one? I've got color change, I've got bilateral breath sounds, and I've got no pulse. Ergo, this is introducing positive pressure into the chest uh, after intubation and uh, increasing RV afterload, which results in the RV failing. Oxidation ventilation management uh, post-intubation. How does that play? Well, we already said that positive pressure in the chest uh, has a striking impact on RV afterload, so let's go easy on the peep. And like easy, I mean zero to start, and then crank it up as needed. Low tidal volumes, and then maintenance of adequate ventilation and adequate pH are also essential in keeping that RV in a, its most um, salvageable state possible. In the end, physiology matters. I'm back. Uh, Alex talked uh, about some of the things that I'll uh, cover, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time covering ground that he already did, but I think I can uh, quickly leave you with a few takeaways that perhaps make the whole concept of risk stratification easier. I love this quote. It was taken straight out of uh, the guidelines put out by the PERT Consortium in 2019. And I think it really highlights uh, what we're talking about. The reality is that the great majority of patients who present to medical attention and are diagnosed with a PE are going to do okay. Perhaps as many as 85% of those patients are gonna be treated with anticoagulation alone. Some of them may be hospitalized for a brief period of time and then turn back to the community and they're going to do fine. We spend a lot of time, rightfully so, talking about the small minority of patients who require additional attention and that's where the risk stratification comes in. Everything about risk stratification in PE has to do with the RV's ability to overcome the afterload or increased resistance in the pulmonary artery that Chad alluded to, which is caused by the thrombus. That is what tells us what this patient's risk is. And when we say risk, we're talking about the risk due to the clot that we just diagnosed. Again, 85% of the people are not going to have overwhelming risk due to the clot that you just diagnosed them with. The reason we treat them with anticoagulation is to prevent the next clot because we know that patients who have had pulmonary embolism are at a significant risk of having another one if we don't intervene. And treating them with anticoagulation prevents the next clot. Their body will take care of the clot that they have in the supermajority of cases in those scenarios. But the risk stratification related to the clot that they've just diagnosed and whether they're at an increased risk of having problems related to that clot is primarily based upon the RV's ability to compensate for the increased resistance in the pulmonary vasculature. And there are four main domains that help inform our understanding of how the right ventricle is doing 
in the face of the acute clot. We have physiological parameters, tachypnea and hypoxemia, Chad alluded to dead space and VQ mismatching. Tachycardia may play an important role in our understanding of how that heart is responding to the clot that we've just diagnosed. Certainly hypotension is the end result of the heart's ability to maintain cardiac output and forward flow. And by convention, we use a systolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 90 millimeters of mercury as sort of our cutoff line for a shock in the setting of acute PE. But importantly, we may see patients who are hypertensive at baseline and present with relative hypotension. Their blood pressure is normal if we purely look at the number, but it's not normal for them. And this can be an important clue or sign as well. So physiology is one domain to gauge the health of the right ventricle. Another is to use the risk assessment scores. I love the case that Alex presented because by physiology alone, that patient seemed to be very low risk. They weren't especially tachycardic. They weren't hypoxemic. Physiologically, they were essentially intact. But risk is more than just cardiac physiology. In that case, risk had to do with that patient's history of cancer. And these are where indices such as the PESI and S-PESI, the Hestia criteria, or the European Society of Cardiologists risk stratification algorithms can be uh, very integral. A third domain for gauging the health of the right ventricle is imaging findings, whether by CT or echocardiography. Cardi you might see right ventricular enlargement and dysfunction, pulmonary artery enlargement, and a <coughs> sometimes seen an important clue as to uh, putting the pieces together and understanding how the right ventricle is adapting to the increased afterload might be the presence of hepatic contrast reflux on the CT images. The fourth important domain for gauging right ventricular function in the face of acute PE are serum biomarkers. And specifically, we're talking about troponin and BNP, which are used at the time of diagnosis in patients to help further risk stratify. Another important biomarker that we don't often speak about uh, to the same degree that we do troponin and BNP, but which might give us some additional uh, uh, prognostic information is the measurement of a serum lactate because as we know, uh, lactate may give us an idea about the uh, oxygenation of the vital organs. I think it's very, very important after speaking about those four domains to also say that none of these factors, either individually or together, really definitively determine prognosis and clinician gestalt plays a huge role in stratifying risk. And we can all think of many examples of things not uh, here in these boxes that might inform our understanding of how to treat a patient or the risk that that patient may have related to their venous thromboembolic disease. I'll briefly cover uh, low risk PE. Again, this is 70% of all pulmonary embolism cases. This is low hanging fruit. These are patients in, for whom the right ventricle has compensated adequately for the acute rise in pulmonary vascular resistance. These patients are hemodynamically stable, meaning their systolic blood pressure is at least greater than 90. Their s pesi score is less than one, that means zero. They have no right ventricular dilation or dysfunction by CT angiography or by echocardiography. There's no elevation of their cardiac biomarkers. And again, we're talking about troponin and either BNP or N-terminal pro-BNP. These low-risk patients have a 30-day all-cause mortality of about 1%, as Dr. Glusman alluded to. The standard of care here is anticoagulation therapy, uh, whether that be initially with anoxaparin or heparin with a quick transition to a DOAC, or as we'll see, many of these patients uh, can be safe for early discharge or outpatient management, and we might uh, elect to start an oral anticoagulant such as a DOAC uh, as the initial anticoagulation therapy. Again, these patients, we've made the diagnosis, they pose no high risk features. Uh, their body by and large is going to take care of those clots well. They may be suited to outpatient management with anticoagulation alone because their body has been able to withstand the punch, if you will, of the acute PE.
we start to get into a little bit more complexity when we speak about intermediate low-risk pulmonary emboli. These represent approximately 15%, give or take, of all pulmonary embolism cases. These patients are also hemodynamically stable, but these patients may have an s pesi that's greater than or equal to 1. They are characterized by the presence of either or, either right ventricular dilation or dysfunction by CT angiography or echo, or in the absence of such, elevated cardiac biomarkers, including troponin and BNP or N-terminal pro-BNP. The 30-day all-cause mortality in these patients is considerably higher, uh, perhaps as many as 8.5 to 15 percent, uh, compared to 1 percent for low-risk pulmonary embolism. These patients, uh, while they have an elevated risk, don't quite have the level of elevated risk that leads us to consider uh, thrombolytic therapy or uh, necessarily interventions. Uh, we might, however, consider in patients such as these to check a lactate, again, to provide us with a little more sense for how the vital organs are being perfused and oxygenated. These patients, again, the standard of care is going to be anticoagulation. But typically, these patients are probably going to be observed for at least 24 hours in the hospital, perhaps up to 48 hours. And we may start with a parenteral anticoagulant, such as anoxaparin or heparin, before eventually transitioning to a DOAC or warfarin. Again, these patients are primarily going to be managed for at least one to two days in the hospital with telemetry monitoring, supportive care, and serial reevaluation of symptoms. I think it's also important in this particular population of patients to really um, consider source control and ask ourselves, have we searched for or considered a significant proximal DVT, such as an iliofemoral DVT? Have we really uh, taken care to take a history and make sure that these patients have not been experiencing inordinate uh, peripheral extremity symptoms? These patients might be candidates for either a temporary IBC filter in the case of, say, an iliofemoral clot and uh, several of the features that we discussed, such as either the RV dilation or elevated cardiac biomarkers. And, of course, if they have symptomatic extremity DVTs, they may be candidates for thrombo thromboreductive therapy. Wow, it is so great to join this panel. Uh, and uh, I'm really so honored uh, to be part of this program. And I think when you look at PE management at Piedmont Atlanta, uh, our PERT is a really a PE program that consists of all of the critical care doctors that you've heard uh, speak and all of their partners uh, and uh, our partners on the interventional side. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, these are the original uh, PERT interventional partners that you see here, along with Grant Reynolds, who was the uh, data keeper and uh, uh, cheerleader for this entire team for so long. Um, I showed this slide many places across the country, uh, and uh, everyone was amazed at the multidisciplinary approach that we've been able to take. Now, we've got three new teammate, teammates that I want you to know about. Uh, Dr. Catherine Kokel is an interventional cardiologist. And Raquel Jones and Eli Lutsky are vascular surgeons at Eastside who came to Eastside already with PE skills and are employing them there. So we've got new teammates, uh, and, and I think that's great. Finally, never pass up a chance to say thank you. And uh, really, when you talk about a program, it's more than just uh, the medical staff. It's everybody else here at this hospital who supports what we're doing, all the way from uh, care link and patient intake, all of our critical care nursing, our cath lab, who we work to death, our CVOR, our perfusionists who do an amazing job, and uh, also our research teams. And I want to thank our industry partner. Uh, Tamara Klimmer is here from Anari. 
She sponsored our dinner tonight, and we're so grateful. Uh, and then Boston Scientific has been a partner all along the way as well. So with that having been said, let's talk about intermediate high risk. This is the group that still has a blood pressure greater than 90, but has both an RVLV ratio greater than 0.9 and a positive troponin. And then the European guidelines, uh, S-PESI uh, should be greater than or equal to one or the PESI score between three and five. Um, but really there's a lot of gaps in stratification and uh, Dr. Klein and I were just talking over there about the fact that in young people, you can see an inter intermediate high risk PE uh, with an SPC of zero. Uh, and we've seen it quite frequently. Um, now, why is intermediate high risk so important? Well, these patients have a non negligible risk of PE related death without reperfusion therapy. And this is our most common. A group of people that we consider for intervention. So if you look at uh, our data from uh, July 1, 2014 through the end of 2020, you can see that in about almost 500 patients there, 87% were intermediate risk, most of whom were high, and then 13% were high risk. And these are the patients uh, the intermediate risk patients that you have to think about what you're going to do. Are you going to intervene or are you not? And so what's our primary goal for management of intermediate risk PE? And that's to try and reduce the PE related death to zero. And I know that you see the figure for intermediate risk, uh, intermediate high risk of having a three to five, three to 15 percent chance of uh, death, but that's all cause uh, mortality. Uh, really, in this group, there should be less than a 3% chance of a PE-related death if they get to us in time and we're doing our job right. Now, given that most all these patients will survive with anticoagulation therapy and modern uh, critical care and modern medical management, it's imperant, it's, it's really an imperative that we keep their interventional complications low and PE-related death as close to zero as possible. And it's interesting in this group, because they will often survive without intervention, uh, therapeutic anticoagulation remains the standard of care. And you think, oh, really? I mean, how can this be? Here's a patient from just uh, last week who came in with a big saddle. Uh, RVLV ratio of 1.75, uh, and you think for that patient, heparin can be standard of care. There's got to be a huge gap in what we can do for these patients and what uh, uh, the available evidence-based supports. And because of that, we are part of the high pytho trial uh, here at Piedmont, which takes intermediate high-risk patients with high-risk criteria and randomizes them between ECOS and catheter-directed therapy, I mean, sorry, ECOS and catheter-directed therapy versus heparin in a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is happening in 400, it's happening in 65 sites across Europe and the United States with a target enrollment of about 406 to 500 patients. And the primary endpoint in this trial is to look at PE-related death, cardiovascular decompensation, or recurrent PE. And uh, I think this is the trial to end all trials uh, because it's really going to tell us whether or not all that we can do is really working. And I think we all know it is right now. So if you look at all the things that we can offer, Here on the left, you see the flow retriever, which is really a workhorse device for us. And you see the ECOS device over here, which is the other workhorse uh, device. So what are we trying to do with intermediate risk? We're trying to rescue the right ventricle, reduce thrombus load, decrease total pulmonary vascular resistance, and minimize complications with good patient selection good technique selection, good technical execution, 
and meticulous critical care to achieve the best available patient outcome. So how do we choose who to intervene on? And I, I have a, um, a matrix here which helps me. First of all, I think about severity and presentation, uh, whether or not they've got an elevated shock index and narrowed pulse pressure, or they came in with syncope, or they had a brief arrest. Uh, tachycardia, hypoxemia, especially if it's been present all along and it's getting worse. Unfavorable biomarkers that are trending in the wrong direction and an unfavorable echo or CTPA findings uh, with really severe uh, changes like the uh, reflux into the vena cava as uh, Dr. Glusman was showing. Now, not all patients that are high risk PE patients need reperfusion therapy. Some that come in with normal vital signs and normal oxygenation with minimally elevated biomarkers that tend to trend toward normal after only a few uh, repeated labs. There are patients that have an increased risk of bleeding or an increased procedural risk, like being massively obese, uh, uh, that may do better without reperfusion therapy. Patients with advanced age, greater than 70, frailty, a limited life expectancy, you've got to have a lot of judgment here and many of those patients certainly do not need intervention. They're going to do fine with medical management. And then a favorable echo that goes along with these favorable uh, other signs uh, can be very helpful. That's an echo with basically a normal TAPSI, minimal McConnell sign, no septal bowing. Those patients will often do well without reperfusion therapy. So here are our choices for intervention, and I'll give you mainly what we use here at Piedmont. Uh, if you have an intermediate risk patient that deteriorates and becomes a crisis, uh, you may go with TPA and a full dose uh, uh, treatment, or you can go the mechanical circulatory support with VA ECMO, uh, which is what we favor whenever we can uh, here at Piedmont. Now our workhorse for intermediate cases is large bore aspiration thrombectomy. We use the flow retriever more than anything else. Uh, and uh, then for more, and, and for these particular patients, they have more central thrombi, more saddles, more obstructive uh, uh, thrombi. And then for ECOS, uh, uh, we often save that for more peripheral uh, PEs in this day and time. So here are a couple of examples. His first case was a young man uh, that uh, was uh, persistently tachycardic upon admission uh, to one of our outside hospitals and had this particular CT scan uh, that you can see right here. Uh, Dr. Coley uh, performed the PERT intake call uh, and uh, rightfully had this man transferred in the middle of night uh, here, uh, and we took the patient to the lab and performed a large bore aspiration thrombectomy uh, with a very satisfactory result. Over here is another case uh, from just uh, earlier this month, 74-year-old man, older gentleman uh, with more peripheral uh, emboli that we took to the lab and did an ECOS case with catheter-directed thrombolysis and he also did very well uh, with that therapy. Now, what about intermediate high risk in crisis? Uh, these are very risky cases to be in the lab with, uh, and they're cases that show rapid worsening with an elevated shock index that may be getting worse, a pulse press pressure that's narrowing, and an increasing O2 requirement. And so if you're facing a case like this uh, that just isn't getting better and you can't get into the lab quickly, systemic TPA or proactive ECMO before the arrest is the way you proceed. Now, if you're in the lab and you've already got this situation ongoing, it's good to start a norepinephrine drip to support the RV, even if they're not uh, absolutely hypotensive. Uh, and... Then to get in, you do your right heart cath, 
And if your opening PA systolic pressure is greater than 60, or your opening cardiac index is less than uh, two, uh, then you want to plan your procedure. They have a, a short time in the lab. You may consider precannulation, and you may even consider proactive uh, cannulation and initiation of VA ECMO, uh, and then going forward with your procedure. And these are trends that are happening nationally right now. And Dr. Klein and Dr. Barrett will talk a little bit more of the, about these. Now, what can possibly go wrong, and why does everybody not need re reperfusion therapy? Well, think about this. There is a possibility of major bleeding complications that can be intracranial, retroperitoneal, or access site. There's always a possibility of structural damage, uh, like a cardiac perforation with hemopericardium, or valvular damage. There can be intra-procedural cardiac arrest. And that is something that we're learning more and more about as we uh, do more and more large bore aspiration thrombectomy cases. And then finally, there are systemic problems that can happen like nephropathy and contrast allergies. Now, even though all of those complications may occur, we're doing a really good job with these patients and the outcomes that you can expect uh, from most uh, of our two workhorse therapies include an RVLV ratio reduction of about 30%, 20% reduction in PA pressures, reduced length of stay, and really good outcomes and quality of life at 30 days and one year, all with a less than a 3.5% risk of major bleeding complications and a 0 to 3% procedural related mortality. And uh, even in the real world, this data holds up. And uh, so there have been a number of trials uh, that are the source of this particular data here. And then we have real world registries where FLASH uh, recently was uh, published showing a 1.8% of major adverse events in over 800 patients. Knockout was the ECOS trial and a 1.8% major bleeding complication rate. So these are really fabulous results in high risk sick patients who are at risk for going the wrong way. So I'll summarize by saying that observation is safe for many intermediate high-risk PE patients, but patients with high-risk features like a worsening shock index and narrow pulse pressure, uh, hypoxemia, they can go the wrong way in the snap of a finger. And so you've got to watch them. And they are candidates for reperfusion therapy and can be expected to do well. You also need to trend your clinical parameters, and that can be sometimes the best guide for deciding to intervene or not in those patients that do not have high-risk features. And then finally, invasive management is always dependent upon risk-benefit analysis. It's a decision made together with the patient and a decision made collaboratively with your PERT team colleagues. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, I'm Drew Klein. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the interventional cardiologists here. I'm also a part of the uh, PER consortium. And talk a little bit about massive PE right now. Catheter-directed therapy, I will argue, is in fact a new standard. Uh, that is controversial. Depends on from center to center, but we'll see what we can do. I have no conflicts of interest other than I'm part of the uh, board of trustees for the PER consortium. I'm happy to take anyone's money if you want to give me some. And with that, I'm going to move on to PE category, specifically massive high risk. As we heard about here, this is peop these are people who are coming in DEFCOM 1. They are dying at the door. Or they're on the verge of death as we are. And as we mentioned earlier, if your patient's on five antihypertensives as an outpatient and their blood pressure is 120, they probably are in this category as well. So very important to understand that it is a relative hypotension per se. And for those patients who have had cardiac arrest. So I'm a very, very simple person. I'm just a plumber, so I think about it this way. Look, if you have a big clot, you can dissolve it systematically with, a, with TPA. You can give clot-busting medication locally. You can suck it out. You can spin around and try to break it up. You can cut it out surgically, 
or it's all about your risk benefit ratio for each of these to determine which way is the best way to go for each individual patient. Remember, it's about the right procedure for the right patient at the right time, okay? So what about treatments of mass APE? Well, I mean, you got lytics, you got surgery, question MCS, we'll talk a little bit more about that. You must choose, but please choose wisely. And for those of you who are over the age of 30, hopefully you get this reference. Um, Systematic thrombolysis, alteplase to neckplase, there is a slight difference between that. We need to be worried about intracranial risk. We usually reserve this for the massive PE who is unstable. You often hear about patients who are being transferred with TPA basically taped to their thigh in case they decide to decompensate in route. Here's the data, by the way. Eight patients, that's it, eight clinical patients at all. Basically received either streptokinase or heparin. Four patients in the streptokinase group survived. <laughs> and everyone else just died. So here's your gold standard for streptokinase or lytics in the setting of massive PE. It's based on eight patients. And by the way, as we look at the data, thrombolytics are actually not used in most unstable patients. There seems to be a fear about using this, and this is a little bit older, but this data continues to persist. So it is important to understand that lytics still exist in 2023. Uh, if you look at the data, data looking at PE and specifically in patients who receive ECMO, we're actually seeing a little bit um, better choice in those patients who receive ECMO first, systemic thrombo thrombolytics afterwards. All patients receiving uh, thrombolysis prior to ECMO died. Um, as somebody who put in cannulas today, it's never good to watch a 24 French venous and a 17 French arterial sheath bleed in the setting of TPA. So it's ECMO first and then give lytics. What about surgical embolectomy? So this is from my friend, Dr. Josh Goldberg up in New York. Uh, very good data out there to say that, in fact, this is one option for patients. Uh, again, that is a single center study. Uh, really looking at in, in their hands at Westchester is a very good outcome. Uh, patients have to make it to there. If you look at mass APE, they have a mortality of 11.6%. They did not dive into this, but I would suggest that probably most of this happened during intubation in the OR. So uh, as you note, noted earlier at shock trauma, which a lot of us are trying to emulate, we'll go with ECMO cannulation first before proceeding with anything else. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So mass APE for surgery, yep, absolutely. Embolectomy is definitely uh, gratifying gets these nice big clots out in once and it's one option but patients have to make it through it and remember your patient is going to be left with a sternotomy scar for the rest of your life and usually what is the number one killer of cardio in life is cardiovascular disease so eventually they'll come down our way and might need a bypass down in life what about ECOS? We talked all a little bit about ECOS. What is it? It's a catheter that has ultrasound on it that's supposed to unwind and thin fiber and exposing clots. It's supposed to help dissolve clot better. It's basically a tube which drips clot busting medicine and emits ultrasound. Uh, more drug is supposed to reach the entire clot. What about other ways? You can suck it out. There's a big device called the Angiovac. This is a huge device, uh, which is not very man uh, maneuverable, but is great for IVC clot, but also clot in transit. There's a number of aspiration thrombectomy devices out there from small to large. Uh, we'll go a little bit into this. Uh, Dr. Ross talked about the Inari, which is a 24 French catheter, which uh, is used very safely in the, to get up into the PA, as you've seen here, and to aspirate clot. They can use these discs as well, but usually most of the time just putting a 24 French catheter up there and performing what's called flash aspiration is very effective. Uh, there is data for this, by the way. There's uh, the FLAME trial, which has recently was presented. It's the largest perspective trial of intermediate of patients with high-risk PE. And what you'll notice is that with aspiration thrombectomy, we did see a drop in, um, in badness happening. So the big thing is lower adverse outcomes and mortality compared to other contemporary treatments. So I think we are getting more data in this space with real trials as we're moving forward. So stay tuned. So what about treatment of mass PE using catheters? I just mentioned some of those catheters are out there. This is a little bit older trial, looking all the way back to 2009, that modern techniques and modern being now almost 15 years old included just putting a pigtail up there and spinning it around to try to break open the clot. Clinical success was actually 87%. Uh, patients did quite well. 33% uh, of them just got mechanical therapy alone. I think the key thing here more than anything is that angiojet, which was thought to be, which is a type of catheter, really caused some bad outcomes, breaking up the red blood cells uh, using a type of 
uh, aspiration or rheolitic thrombectomy is probably not a good idea. The pulmonary vascular bed does not do well with the adenosine that's released from the RBC, so we don't have a tendency to use that here. Chuck covered the workhorses that we do here. So if you're going to do one thing, you can mechanically break open your clot, and that's one thing you can do, and that's just with a pigtail catheter, and those patients did even well. Um, what about ECMO support? Where does that come in? I'm going to try to tee up Dr. Barrett here, who's going to come up about this. Uh, what about the perfect registry, which actually showed 100, greater than 100 massive and submassive, 80% clinical rest uh, success rate just using catheters alone, significant reduction, reductions in PA pressure. That means we're reducing thrombus. The RV gets happier. The patient lives. Here's some data for the ECOS, because people always ask me, well, what's your data for doing that? There's a, this is a single-arm multicenter trial of ECOS for acute massive and submassive, the Seattle 2 trial, uh, read by, uh, done by my friend uh, Greg Piazza. And this basically showed that in 150 patients, of which 31 were acute massive, uh, who got 24 milligrams of TPA, usually 12 per lung, that in these patients, they'd had uh, a basically a decrease in RV to LV ratio at 48 hours. There was a, uh, and the bleeding risk is acceptable. In fact, if you look at in-hospital death, it was around two, 30-day mortality, four patients. Uh, major gusto bleeding obviously was a little bit higher because you're giving thrombolytics, but not bad. Intracranial hemorrhage, zero zero. That is impressive when you're giving patients TPA. So I think we can safely say that this is an acceptable alternative or a therapy in addition to anticoagulation for these patients with massive PE. So you always call in the Calvary when? When do you call people to put in um, catheters? It's basically if you have a contraindication thrombolysis, they have a large uh, mass in their brain. Uh, failed thrombolysis or shock is likely to cause death before systemic thrombolysis can take effect. So I'm going to challenge you to say that maybe it's time for a change for mass at PE. Maybe we need to think about mass at PE a little bit differently. Uh, I put the cath lab up here as the Hulk trying to stop the death train as it's coming at you because we know mass at PE patients do very, very poorly. So what can we do to help offload, as Dr. Miller talked about, the RV does not tolerate these massive increases in PA pressure. What can we do to offload it to make sure that we can stabilize so we can breathe, the patient can breathe, and we can decide what the next option is? Well, your options are ECMO. There's some RVAD devices out there, Tandem, Heart, Protect Duo, Impella RP. And then do you go to cath lab or the OR? Well, once the patient is stable, you can decide where to go. So with that in mind, maybe our first question should be, should I institute emergent MCS? Not what do we do now? Should I basically put the patient on ECMO first? That's gonna be the first question. If the answer is yes, well, first of all, let's consider some things. What's their risk of going on ECMO? What's, do they have metastatic terminal stage four cancer? Do they have a reasonable age? Are they escalating pressures? Have they had an in-hospital in rest? What's their safe score? I'll defer to Dr. Baird to talk a little bit about this. But this is how we can determine if patients are good candidates for additional support. And really, I think what we're looking at here is a bridge. We're trying to look at MCS as a bridge to support, a bridge to figure out what's going to be the next step. And this is where you can take patients that are literally dying and move them on, stabilize them, take a breath, and call in everyone else is around and say, okay, what do we shoot next? Eco, should we go to Inari? Should we try to dissolve or rip out some of this cloud? What's the best way to do this at this point now that the patient is stable? Here's some predictors of mortality with ECMO use, by the way. If you're obese, if you're a diabetic, you're hypertensive, uh, age, and obviously female uh, sex, probably because of size, is another issue as well. So I think you know, it's important to understand that these are risk factors for mortality when using ECMO for massive PE. So here's a comparison looking at MCS from a long time ago, 1990 to 2018, and the primary outcomes were weaning from circulatory support and discontinuation home. If you look at the data, people did probably a little bit better. Uh, the RVAD recipients, by the way, weaned from support that's relatively small, but patients actually did pretty well with just ECMO alone. So in stable, when I say stable, I mean somebody not actively getting CPR, can you take them to the cath lab with MCS on standby with a massive P and then choose between catheter to thrombolysis and bolectomy? And that depends upon bleeding risk, experience, anatomy, all these things. So patients who are stable that can be transported to the lab, you have to be aware that anytime these people can fall off the cliff, 
uh, you need to have that MCS on standby and be ready to cannulate. And if need be, put in catheters even before you go and try to do your embolectomy so that you can move the patient right onto MCS quickly and efficiently, if not do it prior. For unstable massive PE, I think it's cannulate, cannulate, and cannulate, either that be in the ER, in the ICU, some other hospital, whatever it may be. And then do we give TPA? Maybe, but definitely not before cannulation. And then proceed to the cath lab for catheter-directed thrombolysis, thrombectomy, or surgical embolectomy. I think the key thing here is that in these patients, once you get them stabilized on ECMO and on MCS, you have a chance to breathe, literally and figuratively, and move on to your next options. And so with that, I can't do anything without finishing up with a team approach because this is a multidisciplinary team. For those of you who have interest, uh, the PERT Consortium puts out a meeting every year. It's the only meeting where one topic, pulmonary embolism, you'll see in one room every single discipline that this touches, from hematology to ER to vascular surgery to interventional cardiology to vascular medicine, hematology, and across the board. And this is an option really, and that's what we're all trying to do is reduce, reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with this disease. And with that, I'll say thank you very much, and we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, Peter Barrett. I'm a CT surgeon and the director of the ECMO program. And um, generally, uh, they put me at the end because I'm the closer, because if you're calling me, you and your patient are probably in deep doo-doo. But um, about, uh, sorry, there's about 700,000 uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrests each year. And it's been uh, proven that about 2 to 5% of those are uh, attributable to pulmonary embolism. So that roughly equates to about 14,000 to 35,000 out-of-hospital arrests are due to PE. And this was uh, by autopsy. So recently, as you've heard, people are moving towards um, uh, considering MCS uh, support. So this was a um, article in the fall of 2022, uh, uh, which basically said that uh, we're thinking about this, it seems to be uh, effective, uh, but there are actually uh, no real studies that, uh, that prove this. Um, this is a group in uh, New Mexico, uh, the University of um, New Mexico in Al Albuquerque. And uh, what they did is they looked at their experience from uh, March uh, 2017 to July uh, 2019, where they had 17 uh, patients with massive uh, pulmonary embolism, who they placed on ECMO for initial hemodynamic instability. 76% uh, uh, of those patients survived to discharge, uh, which was very good. And importantly, 11, sorry, 12 out of 13 uh, were neurologically intact. So uh, this, is, this is the most recent uh, information. This is from uh, the American Heart Association. It is a um, consensus statement that was published at the end of January of this year. Uh, and you can see at the, uh, at the bottom um, down here, this was also endorsed by the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, Society of Thoracic Surgeons, Society of Cardiovascular Angiography, uh, the Society of Thrombosis and Vascular Biology. And um, what this says, though, um, is uh, I'm not here to talk about surgical embolectomy, but the modern um, survival of surgical embolectomy uh, is about, um, uh, sorry, the mortality is about 2%. But uh, like everybody spoke before me, uh, we're talking about predominantly the high risk, but as we've heard, and I would echo my personal uh, bias and gestalt, is that the intermediate risk uh, high should probably get serious consideration for some sort of intervention, because I think there uh, is a group of those people that go on to develop CTEP, uh, and these are probably younger people that we can, we can improve their uh, life down the road. But when I get the call, we're talking about high risk, fulminant uh, RV failure and or uh, cardiac arrest. So uh, as Dr. Miller and everybody pointed out, uh, acutely the RV does not like an increase in afterload. Uh, this leads to volume overload, RV distension, RV ischemia. Uh, what Dr. Miller pointed out is that 
Um, the RV distension causes uh, myocardial uh, compression of the vessels in the RV, because unlike the LV, RV um, uh, coronary blood flow is continuous throughout systole and diastole, whereas in the LV it's two thirds in diastole and a third in systole. And basically you get in the death spiral that Dr. Uh, Miller mentioned you get a uh, decreased um, LV filling and you get um, uh, cardiogenic shock. So again, this is what uh, uh, everybody has seen before. Uh, the ratio you can determine it readily on echo, uh, sorry, CT or echo. But both cardiopulmonary bypass and VA ECMO support improve RV function. It decreases RV pressure and volume overload, decreases your RV LV ratio, decreases RV ischemia and enhances systemic perfusion. The main difference here is the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit has a reservoir, VA ECMO does not. So this is a paper out of uh, Germany, which looked at, uh, this was in resuscitation uh, in October of this past year. And what this is, it's a retrospective study from 2005 to 2018, where they looked at all pulmonary embolism patients in uh, the country of Germany. And what they found was 0.2% uh, of all those patients received um, ECMO support. And what that comes down to is they had uh, 2,197 patients with a mortality of 62%. So it wasn't very effective uh, in their hands. So you can see that most of the patients that got uh, ECMO support were relatively young, and those that got a combination of thrombolytics and ECMO support was very small. So if you're gonna go over to Oktoberfest and you get off the plane in Munich and you have some chest pain, you better hope the thrombolytics work because you're not getting anything else. Uh, this is a um, paper I could find that uh, showed basically there's 16 case series that have been reported uh, for VA ECMO and outcomes in patients with pulmonary embolism. This goes back to 1992 all the way up to about uh, 2019. All these patients were massive pulmonary embolism and the total adds up to about 313 uh, patients. So not a lot of experience uh, out there with uh, ECMO and, and PE. But uh, the experience we've had here at Piedmont is um, not bad, not bad. This is early data from the uh, registry here at Piedmont that Dr. Uh, Ross was kind enough to share with me. This is from uh, 2014 to 2018. And in that time frame, there were 26 patients that presented uh, and um, wound up having ECMO support. And you can see syncope and CPR at any point in pressors. But uh, what this is, shows is that uh, thrombolytics worked in about 50%. Uh, Catheter-directed therapy was outstanding. E even surgical embolectomy in our hands was very good. And VA ECMO only uh, was poor. But there is emerging data in the literature that just putting someone on VA ECMO support and using systemic heparin, about 45% of those patients go on and do just fine. Clot dissolves, they're well supported. In our experience, the average length of run has been about uh, five days in that patient population. And then in all comers, it was 73% uh, in our early experience. So this is kind of the more recent experience. From 2018 to 2022, we've had 40 patients placed on VA ECMO support uh, for massive pulmonary embolism. Again, for our sister hospitals and other institutions, there is zero indication for VV ECMO in pulmonary embolism. This is hemodynamic support of the right ventricle. Uh, 17 out of the 40 did not survive for about a 42% mortality, and there means was a 58% uh, survival rate. So if you look at this, sorry, if you look at this chart, this is 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22. And so the breakdowns of that, uh, basically in, in 2018, uh, there was a 86% um, survival, six out of seven. In 2019, uh, we probably got ahead of ourselves, uh, thought we were hot stuff, knew how to do this. 
and we took a big step back. It was two out of 10 survived in, in that time frame. And most of this is probably eCPR candidates. And we didn't honestly know how long somebody had been down, the quality of CPR, uh, and things along those lines. So then uh, back in 2020, again, we had tapped the brakes a little bit, and uh, we had a little bit more success, 75% uh, survival. In 2021, it was about 60%, and in 2022, it was up to 67%. Uh, in terms of how does that compare to uh, ELSO, which is the extracorporeal life support organization, sorry, in that time frame, uh, there have been uh, 509 patients reported uh, with uh, VA ECMO support to uh, ELSO, and their mortality rate uh, is 49%. Uh, over the last two years, our mortality rate uh, is about uh, 33, 34%. So we're doing something right, but I would echo everything uh, the guys said. Uh, it, it does allow for hemodynamic stability to occur. It does allow for time for judgment for which is the best treatment and for our outside facilities and hospitals. If you even remotely think about this, please call early because there are logistics involved. Uh, to get to, um, down to Columbus, it takes us about two hours and 20 minutes. To get to Augusta, it's about a three-hour trip. To get down to Macon, it's about two hours and 15, because uh, I've gone to all the, all the facilities. We've cannulated people in ERs and um, in, in the units. And if you need to give uh, thrombolytics, uh, give them. It's not ideal. We'll do our best not to get a retroperitoneal bleed or something along those lines. But if there's gonna be a time delay and you need to do it, please go ahead and do it and we'll do our best to deal with it uh, at the end. Uh, but as the guys mentioned earlier, all these treatments, survival is not the best metric of did the therapy work, because they die of other things. So, um, in hemodynamically unstable patients, survival may not be the optimal measure of efficacy of a particular treatment. In addition to survival, universal measures of RV recovery should be reported. An RV fractional area of change or tricuspid annular plane excursion, TAPSI, these are more specifics of RV function. And that's really what all these things are, are designed to do. And the best heart is a empty, beating, happy heart. If you unload the right ventricle and just let the heart beat, you're already ahead of the game. In our experience, it's been about an average run of probably about seven to 10 days. We've had people come off in four and we've had people go longer. Nobody here since I've been here um, has really required long-term uh, RVAD support. So um, they either die sooner or they get better, but uh, that was a concern in the literature that did these people require long-term uh, RBAD support, and our experience would say no. So we're doing better uh, than um, our colleagues that report data to ELSO, and uh, it is an option that allows for uh, controlled conditions and decision-making. Thank you. All right, so I know we're running short on time here, so I'll wrap things up and put it all together uh, and be kind of brief. I'd like to comment first about the PERT uh, and the PERT Consortium. It is truly a philosophy as much as it is, is an organization or a program. It is, at its core, a collaboration, and, and it is unique, uh, as Drew alluded to, at the meeting, which is in Austin this year in the fall, if you're interested in going. It is a uh, really beautiful thing to see the, the different disciplines collaborating and engaging in a way that we are not accustomed to. Uh, it's truly a, a phenomenon, and the reality is we need it. We, we know so little about this that kills so many. When you think about the number of trials we have in PE compared to acute coronary syndromes, I mean, the TIMI consortium, which stands for thrombolosis of myocardial infarction, alone has 70 trials in acute MI. How many do we got? 
So it's an absolute need and, and couldn't be more important. Um, and again, as like I said, it's a truly, truly interdisciplinary uh, uh, meeting and, and uh, truly a, it's a great thing to have uh, now um, to help move the science and care for these patients along. More importantly, the Piedmont experience as part of the PERT consortium, I think it was worth note. Um, as uh, Chad alluded to at the beginning, uh, many of these people on this panel have served as leadership positions in the PERT consortium from its inception. Uh, we do clinical research, we're involved in device trials, clinical trials, uh, are actually involved in what will probably be a pivotal study, the HyPytho trial, um, and also publication. We publish in the space. Uh, in fact, you'll, you'll see that here shortly. Um, so, you know, um, despite what you might think, we are actually really, really good at this. And I would uh, argue that our per program is as good as anybody's in the country. Uh, and, and I think that um, um, I would uh, also like to think that everyone on this panel, and I can speak for them, that would like to uh, thank um, one gentleman in particular for leading this fight. Um, I must sadly say, as a long doctor, and I've said this publicly before, uh, it was truly um, inspiring to have a vascular surgeon show up and get our pulmonary embolism uh, activities going. Uh, I thought long doctors were supposed to do that, uh, but thankfully Dr. Ross showed up and has really uh, moved this program along. Um, I, I know that uh, we certainly are grateful for his work, uh, as Piedmont Healthcare should be, and I am damn sure the patients are. So what do you do? How do you initiate a PERT call? Uh, you call CareLink at Piedmont Atlanta Hospital, 404-605-2000, and say, I need the PERT. You might also say, I need the PE team. You could also say, I have a PE emergency. Any of these things will elicit a PERT response. And that first call will go to, um, also you say I have a patient with a massive pulmonary embolism. That first call will go to, um, a, a, George, a former Georgia Long, now Piedmont Pulmonary Critical Care Division uh, a physician and be escalated accordingly. As I said that we've published in the space, you can see here the good Dr. Ross on a paper about inter-hospital transfer of patients with acute PE. This is, uh, resides as a framework and the only one of its kind for how to do this. Um, as I said, we make the initial assessment A Piedmont Atlanta Pulmonary Critical Care Physician is contacted. Uh, and then additional team members were added as needed, such as vascular surgery or the interventional cardiologist, uh, CV intensivist, Dr. Barrett, and uh, the ECMO mechanical circulatory support teams. More importantly, we want to definitely ensure local uh, medical optimization. That's our job, receiving that initial PERT call. Um, these include the ABCs, so we want to make sure we have um, airway covered, which ideally, as I said earlier, is non-invasive ventilatory support. Um, if you have to get intubated, make it hemodynamically neutral. I kind of like that term. Avoid high PEEP and hypercapnia. Obviously, we want to oxygenate um, these patients. There's not a lot of role for pulmonary vasodilators of the inhaled sort, this being nitric, iloprost, epiprostanol. Sometimes that's been thrown out in various situations when um, the patient is crashing. Varied, varied response. Obviously, circulation. Be judicious with the volume. Good vascular access. Uh, appropriate use of vasopressors. Uh, and then obviously rescue thrombolysis if needed. So how do we trigger a transfer? What, what kind of makes that happen? Again, uh, a table from this paper, uh, Dr. Ross was part of the author of, uh, a variety of factors kind of come to this conclusion, patient specific. Uh, is there a contraindication, anticoagulation thrombolysis? You need a mechanical thrombectomy device. High risk of bleeding. Uh, complex PE with comorbid conditions. Uh, if you've had a sinkable event in a fall, now we're unclear of uh, what trauma is to the brain, and if you introduce thrombolytics, uh, you know, increased bleeding risk, again, need for advanced uh, therapeutics like mechanical thrombectomies. Um, in transit, the need for a possible surgical embolectomy, a variety of uh, other cases. Transfer is maybe part of their structure. Uh, we certainly do that here. A lot of other health systems, Wellstar in particular, has a lot of people out in the field at smaller hospitals doing some rather sketchy things sometimes. And at Piedmont Healthcare, we have chose to centralize this where content matter expertise as well as, um, as uh, interventional and procedural expertise all are housed in one spot. Um, patient preference sometimes, and then obviously the inability for a local hospital to do adequate diagnostics, et cetera. So 
before we take that patient and transfer, again, a table from uh, the, the, the paper, um, an idea to really kind of go through this and be sure we've got our P's and Q's all lined up. So why are we transferring this patient? What do they look like when they hit the door at the referring hospital? Uh, what's the relevant medical history? Obviously, especially as it pertains to breathing list. Code status is a biggie. What are their vital signs? Again, at presentation, at time of transfer, all available data. Of course, we're very interested in biomarkers, BMP, troponin, et cetera. Bleeding risk assessments. Obviously, did they have a fall as a part of a sinkable event, uh, recent surgeries, et cetera. Um, initial therapies, including non-invasive and invasive ventilation, hemodynamic support, um, and anticoagulation. Uh, stability of the patient for transfer. How are we going to transfer them? Are we going to send them by helicopter? Are we going to send them by an ambulance? Is Dr. Barrett going to go cannulate them in the field? All of these things need to be running through our minds when we're taking these calls. Interestingly enough, I'll go back to initial therapies. Anticoagulation. No, really, are they anticoagulated. Our PERP program has taken patients from other facilities, I won't name them, and the patient was not adequately anticoagulated. We make that assumption, but it is a foolhardy mistake to not be sure that the patient is getting full adequate anticoagulation prior to transfer. This has happened several times, and it's troubling. So, to finish things up, I thought I would leave you with some jokes. We have alternatives. Um, we have alternatives to the PE response team and the PERT consortium strategies. We have things like hang, hope, and haul. That's hang the heparin and send them and hope for the best. We've also got push and pray. Full or half dose systemic thrombolytics given locally and observe. We've got drip and ship. It's where we initiate full or half dose limits, throw them in the ambulance and send them. And we've got one for the road. That's transfer with TP on board to be initiated uh, for clinical worsening during transit. Obviously, these are not very viable, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to uh, contrast what a more complex and well thought out um, presentation might, might be. And with that, uh, I thank you for your time. And uh, I think we have maybe five minutes for a question or two. Can everybody hear me? All right, thank you, Dr. Miller. Let's give a round of applause for this distinguished panel that we have here today.